Right. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the engendering um, data session. Um, the title of our our panel is Harnessing the Power of Data to Empower Women, and we'll be looking at how gender data can be used for the benefit of women, and more especially, um, marginalized groups of women. Um, I'm going to start by introducing myself. Um, my name is Garnet Aching. I am a writer, creative, and techno-sociologist. I'm currently wrapping up my undergraduate degree at the African Leadership University and working on my capstone research on gender and child violence on Kenya and Africa. I am also currently a research fellow at Policy, um, an organization in Uganda, where I'm supporting the development of a mobile game that will be used to teach African women digital security things. Um, since that's, that's about me, I'm just going to introduce um, Elena and Dr. Um, Dr. Hadia. Majid. Um, I'm going to go on with introducing um, Dr. Hadia, uh, sorry, Dr. Hadia and Elena, um, who are going to be our panelists for today. Um, I'm going to start off by reading a short bio of short bios, and then we'll kick off the panel. Um, so Elena Sinel, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Am I? Yeah. Okay. Um, Elena Sinel is an award-winning social entrepreneur and the founder of Teams in AI and Acon Inspirations. She is motivated to make a difference in the world by empowering young people aged 12 to 18 to solve real problems through technologies like AI, VR, AR, MR, and blockchain. Elena is an experienced keynote speaker and frequently speaks on panels, such as the UN AI for Good Global Summit, um, the EU AI Stakeholder Summit and the UN High Panel on Digital Cooperation. Um, she is interested in the future of work and AI, the future of education, innovation in education, and on whether or not robots take away jobs, how to engage Gen Z and make them fit for the 21st century jobs, how to equip Gen Z with 21st century skills, and how to make STEM careers attractive for girls and more. Um, just reading your um, your bio, I am blown away by the work you're doing, and we'll get to hear more of that as we go on with the panel. Thank you, um, <laughs> um, Next up, I'm going to introduce a uh, second panelist, Dr. Had Hadia Majid. Um, a Fulbright scholar, Dr. Hadia Majid holds a PhD in development economics from the Ohio, Ohio State University. A research agenda considers the impact of monetary and public resource constraints on individual welfare in Pakistan. Her work includes cash transfer evaluation, public goods provision, human capital acquisition in the context of intra-household decision making, and factors affecting women's access to earned income. Her expert her expertise lies in RCT quasi-experimental and quantitative driven fieldwork. She has also done qualitative field, qualitative work with low literate, low income women workers, and currently is focused on labor markets in Pakistan, where she documents and explores the barriers to women's labor supply and their access to decent, empowering work. Garnet, Sabine um, asked me to introduce myself oh. after. I don't know if you've seen the chat channel. Uh, I'm just seeing Thanks. it right now. So Should sorry. that be fine? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, so my name is Rabia uh, Dr. Khan. I have a PhD in human genetics and I've built uh, machine learning teams in London um, and uh, work at the intersection of bio and AI. And so really excited to be on the panel because um, I think it's really important to encourage women to have careers in STEM. And like Dr. Hadi, I was born and raised in Pakistan. Um, and I'm actively recruiting women to join my team, either in machine learning or biology. Well, um, that um, we have our, our panelists. Thank you so much for introducing yourself, Rabia. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm just gonna kick off the panel with the first question. And our first question is, um, basically, um, a couple of year, years back, data is the new oil, oil was a mantra being championed by tech leaders worldwide. Yet, we are now realizing that the kind of data available matters. Um, in light of this, 
why is data disaggregated along gender lines important? And you can just contextualize this with your area of work as you answer the questions. Uh, I'm going to start off with Elena, and then Dr. Hadia, and then Rapia. Elena. So sorry, we can't hear you. Classic mistake. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for telling me that I was muted. Uh, sometimes they don't, and I go on for, for five minutes or more just talking to myself, apparently. But a uh, real, real, real pleasure to be here today with you. Um, and for the second time here at the Girls' Summit. Um, and thank you so much for having me here, uh, Ananki, um, and for um, being here on the panel with uh, these two incredible uh, ladies in, in tech. Um, so my name is Elena. I am the founder of Teens and AI, as Gant already mentioned. And my work um, really is about empowering every young person across the world into machine learning or AI for um, so gone are the days when we teach kids how to code. Uh, I think now is the time when we really need to, need to uh, teach kids how to, how to think and how to solve real problems um, using technology. And uh, that is really uh, what I do. And in response to the question that Garnet um, asked, I, I have the following to say. Um, so to me, uh, data um, is important, but what is more important is how we collect the data and who works at the, at the very core of technology um, at the moment. So we have less than 20% of women at the moment represented in the field of technology. Um, and uh, what that means is that we don't have um, enough uh, technologies developed by diverse enough teams. And it's not only women that we don't have enough of, we also don't have enough people of color. Uh, I think in Google, less than 4% uh, of employees are people of color. And we don't even have uh, the right statistics yet accurate enough for disabilities um, or for um, other genders like LGBTQ, uh, for instance. Um, and, um, and this is really something that's very important for, for any um, you know, product or any technology that will be shaping the future. And we need, really do need to get this right. And when it comes to data collection or working with data again, uh, we do uh, encounter a lot of biases. And that is, again, because the teams are not diverse. The kind of data that's out there is also not diverse and not representative of the makeup. And this was really evident in the work of um, Joy uh, Boyle-Lambini, who um, detected there was racial bias in one of the algorithms when she was, uh, when the algorithm was unable to detect her because she was black. Um, and there is a lot of work that's being done um, out there by the most incredible technologists who are really showing various biases, whether it's in recruitment algorithm or with regards to racial biases or disabilities. Um, and, and this is really all very important uh, to me. And I'm really grateful Rabia has just literally mentioned uh, when, when she was introducing herself that she is hiring women you know, in machine learning and, and biology because that's very important that we as women also do support other women and, um, and, and, and we encourage more women to join those kind of fields. And that is the only way where we can ensure that the data is representative of the makeup and we are developing the kind of technology that's, um, that is tackling real issues in a, in a fair and non-biased way. Um, right, right. And it's really should I, should I continue? So oh, sorry, yes, please go next. Uh, I will recap after. No, no, no problem. Um, so I appreciate everything that Elena has said and it, it really hits the nail on the head. And what we've been seeing in a lot of the social sciences, for example, is that for the longest time, all of the models, all of the data that was gathered was very, not just male specific, but also very Eurocentric. And when we started to evolve beyond that, and that okay, we do need to look at gender, for example, uh, a lot of the models would just add gender and stir. So there was no real delving into the mechanisms or the systemic nature of what is it, what what are the constraints that women really face, what is what are the factors that affect women or even transgenders differently from men. And that's something that the 
many of the social sciences and something like economics, which is tended to be very, very male centric, have slowly evolved over time to incorporate. So now what we're seeing more and more is this recognition that you can't look at averages, you need to look at distributions. When you look at distributions, you need to think about um, not just women versus men, but you also need to think about different ages of women. You need to think about different ethnicities, you need to think about different classes, because the experiences uh, that men face versus the experiences that women have in the economy is shaped by not just their gender, but also so many other variables that relate to the socioeconomic uh, conditions. And here, what I also want to highlight is that it's not just enough to be aware of the subject, uh, the gender of the subject, or the socioeconomic background of the subject. You have to consider what is it that the researcher is bringing in. And, and Elena talked about this too, the bias that the researcher brings in. So. A story, a narrative, a statistic that a man interprets is going to be very different from the same statistic being looked at by a woman. It's the same statistic being looked at by a woman from a low income background, from an ethnically marginalized background. Mm -hmm. And I think when we talk about engendering data, we have to consider all of these various aspects. We have to consider the gender of the respondent. We have to consider the gender of the researcher. We have to consider the gender of the person doing the survey itself. So who is it that translates the hypothesis of the researcher and takes it into the field and interviews the uh, subject of the data gathering exercise? Because a lot of it, what we find is that from the hypothesis stage from the experimental stage down to the field stage, it gets it may get lost in translation when it comes to the respondent's bias. Sh uh, sh Garnet, should I go next? Great. So I'm um, yeah, obviously yeah. agreeing with Elena and Hadia because there's a need for uh, increased data sets. But I mean, my world is really biomedicine. And um, in the middle of a pandemic where the vaccines are being run in clinical trials, and if we don't have diversity in the patients that they're being tested in, and we don't consciously think about that, um, whether that's ethnic diversity or gender diversity, um, it's gonna have serious consequences. And I know um, that a lot of clinical trials have been run in men primarily. Um, a lot of the field that I work in, um, Elena, as you mentioned, um, is predominantly male, and you're seeing that in, in the outcomes of the algorithms. And so I, I think when it comes to engendering data, I think it's so important that we think about the outcome first. What is it? What problem are we trying to solve? And I love what you said, Elena, it's about impact. Uh, we need to stop. I'm, I'm a big fan of we don't educate people in silos any, anymore. We, solve, we educate them to solve a problem rather than you're a machine learning researcher or a biologist, because I think those lines now are blurred. And so um, from my perspective, data is absolutely interesting and useful. And the other thing I will say is data is being used to make money now. And um, for developing countries, uh, if they're not careful about how their genetic sequences or their patient records are monetized, then there is going to be a loss of intellectual property. And that's something we should think about deeply, um, specifically with regards to the Genomic Asia projects and the Genomic Africa projects and how that information is used to benefit the populations and not exploited. Right. Um, um, I think what's interesting about what um, all the panelists have said um, is about the the biases of the researchers, even the the researchers, the respondents, and the people who are going to analyze that data. And especially with the example of Joy Bolamini, I think what stands out to me the most about her case is that as a black woman, most of the AI systems and she was training could not even recognize her and she had to wear a white mask to to be able to train the data and it just exposes the need for just examining who is collecting the data because the person collecting the data um has has an oversight of who gets to be um questioned who gets to respond to the question who gets to be sampled who gets to be interviewed and it's also interesting that, um, Rabia, you talk about educating um, people outside of the silos that we're used to. 
And I'm just going to ask um, both um, Elena and Rabia. So Elena, I'm just going to ask you how you work with teenagers to go beyond the silo. You say you work um, with educating teenagers on AI, VR, machine learning. How do you get them out of that um, silo where you're supposed to learn computer only and not the social side of things? Well, with Rabia, how do you ensure that you're hiring people um, who are all rounded or just training the people you're already hiring in being more critical about the social aspects of technology? Yes, for me, uh, what is uh, really important is every program we run, um, it's multi uh, well, diversity is at the very core of everything we do. So when we run a hackathon, which is what we are very well known for, um, or accelerator programs, um, I quite literally make teams manually. I build teams in a way where I know in one team of four or five, there's going to be, you know, boys, girls, somebody where the neural, neurally diverse. So we really do encourage various disabilities. So we've got children who have autism or Asperger's or ADHD, various abilities join us. Um, I also make sure that there are boys and girls from private or state schools or low income families so that they get to interact. To me, this is really, really important that they meet one another. So we will have um, a boy from Eton College, one of the most elite colleges in the world, um, in the same team uh, with another boy from, from Kenya, whose family is a family of farmers right or somebody uh, with another girl who goes from an absolutely ordinary state school here in london or somewhere else so i build those teams to ensure that they do appreciate diversity that's one thing the second thing we do is we don't really uh, teach how to code we teach um, how to think and what i mean by that is we really teach the entire process of product development starting with uh, what we know as humans so at the very core is the problem, uh, the why that we're trying to understand and solve. Um, we're very much aligned with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And so the latest hackathon that the demo day will be actually hosted by the Girl Summit, you will see teenagers trying to tackle mental health, education, diversity. They're trying to tackle so many different issues that are relevant to them, like climate change, something that really um that they're passionate about um and everything is around creating impact so we're not going to teach them how to code for the sake of coding but we will teach them how machine learning and ai uh, can be used uh, to solve a real problem so it's about applied machine learning not academic research not um, you know, learning how to do the nitty gritties but actually how does it all work in the real world and we teach the a very holistic methodology so in the end they even have to think about how is this product going to make money how is it going to sustain itself so it's a fuse of technology and entrepreneurship so we teach hard skills as well as soft skills and i think that's what's important because in the future you know we we, we really do need uh, people who innovate who think outside of the box um, and just coding is no longer sufficient that's what that's what we do but right there i know your approach um to this is quite quite different so we I actually, you know, I think most of the challenges that we're going to face in the future, the Millennium Development Goals, we're not going to address by what we've been doing in the past. At least that's what I believe. Um, and so I, I believe if you put someone like Elena, Hadi, and myself in a room, we've got very different educational backgrounds and say, here's the problem. Can you go away and solve it? And that's probably at that intersection of disciplines is where you will have innovation. And we've seen that in biotech substantially innovation now is coming from the intersection of engineering and biology or the intersection actually of um, I, I had a degree in economics and, and biology and so you know looking at a problem from an economic plus biological perspective and so Ellen I agree with you completely which is how how I believe in solving the problem is by putting together people with different skill sets sure that we have uh, gender diversity, ethnic diversity, intellectual diversity on any given team. And it, it's become a very strange world where we put a lot of weight on people that can code or people that know machine learning. And actually, I think that's now a commodity. And the harder thing is people that can translate machine learning into a valuable outcome that's going to benefit humanity. And that skill set, actually, 
uh, I don't know that there's a degree for that. Um, no. And that's probably the hardest skill set you can acquire because you can now go build a machine learning team if you have money quite quickly. Mm -hmm. I agree. I absolutely agree. Right. Um, so I'm just going to go to the next question. Um, and I would, um, so the question is, how do we ensure that data collected from women and girls is done in an ethical manner and in a way that protects their well-being and safety? And I would like um, Dr. Hadia Majid to answer this first, especially since you work with randomized control trials, which are quite especially, yeah, what do you think about this? Yes, actually, I was just having a meeting before this summit where we were talking about an experiment. And one of the things that we were talking about is that you see so many experiments come up where you're giving incentives to poor people. And then for someone who's living below the poverty line, far below the poverty line, a meager sum of money is, of course, going to matter so much. And they're going to, willing, they're going to be willing to do whatever it is that the researcher asks them. So there's a... There are IRB boards, there are boards that look at your research to make sure it conforms to ethnic, uh, eth ethical uh, requirements. But at the end of the day, when it comes to these ethical requirements, it's really the researchers and they must understand the extent of the responsibility that they have in ensuring that data is collected in a not just ethical manner, and that, and that includes that it's anonymized, it includes that it is not shared, it remains confidential, but at the same time, you also have to be very sensitive to the environment that you're going in. The kind of questions that I ask in my field of research, for example, requires that you are extremely careful of the home environment, of the community environment. You have to think about the repercussions that your questions may have on the woman once you've left, the repercussions that the questions may have on the entire family once you've left. And at the same time, you, in you even have to consider that just your mere presence in this community, in this household, in this family for the short period of time that you're there could have very long-term effects on this family. And so my own work, I'm interested in how safe the work environment is for women, for example. I'm interested in the kind of decisions that are made in the household, how those decisions are made, who is making decisions for women, who is making decisions for girls. I'm interested in even incidents of domestic violence in the household. So these are all subjects that tend to be in some, from being very sensitive to being downright, uh, outright taboo subjects in certain uh, instances. So you you have to be aware of the kind of trust that you need to build within this household within this community and the responsibility that is being faced that you are that you are uh, facing and in a lot of cases that's something that you can only acquire with time and to be honest it really depends on the kind of um, center that the researcher has on his and her own a lot of times what I've seen uh, as far as students are concerned, and I've, I've taken a lot of students into the field in uh, slums in Lahore and Karachi. And what I see then is, and, and that gives me hope, I see that the students, they immediately tune in to the kind of circumstances that they're seeing, which tend to be very different from their own home environments. And um, it they, they, they are able to realize fairly quickly that they are entering a place of and a situation which requires very light treading in a certain, in a lot of cases. So when it comes to the, the question itself about uh, how do you ensure uh, that you're doing something in an ethical manner, unfortunately, to a large extent, the answer is within the person himself, within the person herself. There's only so much external validity that you can do. There's only so much external pressure that you can apply on the researcher. And um, it, it, it comes down to the moral compass that you have. At least that's what I feel. You can go next and then Elena. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know that I have much more to add to that, unfortunately. I think it's a really difficult topic, and um, it falls down to communities, like Hadia said, and, and I sincerely hope we get it right, because you can't unshare a genetic sequence, unfortunately. 
And, and me too. I uh, absolutely um, agree with everything Hadi has said um, and Rabia. And uh, I don't have much to add on this matter, except that, you know, whenever we collect data, whenever we work with any communities, uh, when we develop a product, um, it's very important to develop with the people you're developing this product for. So that automatically means that you have to involve them um, so if you are developing this product for, um, you know, women who are suffering domestic violence, um, you would work with the organizations who have insights or potentially even, you know, women who have either suffered in the past or if you can find women who are currently, you know, in uh, experiencing this situation who are able to help you develop a product that will um, hopefully help um, other women who would benefit. Um, that's something we always recommend and whenever we work with teenagers we always ask them to employ you know a human centered um, approach um, and be very careful uh, we did have um, a team of teenagers four teenage girls product called hopeful home uh, and they still are developing this and they started developing this during um, covid when it just escalated um, here in london as well and the cases of domestic violence have been on the rise um, and out of all the challenges we we have had, you know, offered in that hackathon, it was youth versus COVID hackathon. Uh, they picked domestic violence, um, and we immediately put them in touch with some of the organisations who work in that space, so that they are very careful when they exercise that research and when they ask the right questions to their collecting and how they would synthesise and analyse this data. And these are teenagers doing this work. Um, and it was really, really encouraging to see how at this very young age they have managed to, you know, they approach the, uh, this question very sensitively. And I know right now, um, you know, six months later almost, um, they are working with the local council, Westminster Council, who are um, uh, ready to test their prototype. And this is a very sort of a hidden uh, app, or the way they've developed it is in the shape of, form of a calculator where you don't use this as an app but it's just a um, calculator you're using and in the middle of this uh, there will be some trigger questions that could you know they would be able to input some data to tell um the organizations that can help them that they are in danger and they need help so um i can i can definitely see that you know this is something that's very relevant and very important and whenever we work with vulnerable communities in particular we have to be very careful what kind of data we're collecting and how and and who's then working with this data as well so and anonymizing this data is very important as well um right it's it's quite interesting uh, you talk about human-centered design and as we're talking about ethical research i just have a follow-up question to elena and anyone who might want to answer there are concerns that human-centered design, especially when done by large companies, um, sort of mine communities and smaller marginalized communities for information. For instance, if Facebook wants to talk to um, activists and young girls on how to deal with online violence, they would enlist marginalized users to come into a room and ideate with them and come up with solutions towards this platform, but then they're not credited for, um, yeah, they're not credited for their work or even paid for their work, right? And so it goes back to the concern of ethical research and human-centered design. What, what do you have to say about that? Um, uh, for me personally, are very selective uh, as to what companies we work with. Um, we have not associated ourselves with um, Facebook for that very reason that you have just suggested. And we, whenever we work with companies, we make it very clear that the IP belongs to the participants who develop those ideas. They are not for the companies uh, because the entire mission or the, the core of the event is really to inspire young women and young men you know, everyone into creating something for impact. Um, so we do not really work with companies who want to take the ideas and run with them. That's really not what what happens. Uh, the ideas belong to the boys and girls who develop those products. And then it's up to them whether they would like to take this further. And sometimes they won't because it was maybe just a um, box ticking exercise. They want to go to uni and they just want to create something amazing and they want to show this in their application that they've done something great. So we do have sometimes boys and girls who would participate just because of that. 
and no matter how incredible that idea they will just not take it forward because that's not really what they wanted to do they just wanted to come and learn new skills meet new people make new friends and that's it but every now and then we do see a team who are very persistent and they also know that that idea belongs to them we surround them with some mentors who are happy to help them and you know one of the ideas that we are sort of accelerating right now is hopeful home who are developing something for uh, women suffering with domestic violence and we have some other ideas related to mental health as well with companies we make it very clear that if you want you can partner with these uh, teams uh, of teenagers and work with them so our latest partnership is, for instance, with NHS um, Trust. It's called Tavistock and Portman, um, based here in London. And they are specialized in mental health for young people. And so we have worked with them during the Summer Accelerator Program, which is a three-week uh, program for teenagers. Um, and uh, with uh, this NHS Trust, we've developed products but right now it's the winning team Elios who are designing something for young people so it's young people designing for young people which is exciting and they are going to be working very closely with NHS Trust in order for the NHS Trust to give them the test bed the opportunity to test their product to test their ideas and if that is successful then obviously it would be very exciting for me to see a team of teenagers you know um, rolling out this program across North London to begin with and then gradually across entire London and potentially the UK because what they're developing is really a service for young people that will really point them in the right direction when they really do need help um, and it doesn't diagnose anything it just shows them the pathways of if somebody is depressed if somebody feels um, suicidal you know what do they do next um, and those kind of partnerships are really excite exciting for me uh, to lead on so and and we always make it very clear to the companies you know this is not um you know for you to take the ideas and run with them but it's for you to help young people understand that they have got the potential to change the world because you have done the potential to maybe recruit um from this pool of talent that we have created or you know these young people into your company because they will have shown to you that they can innovate and solve real problems Rabia. That's working with the NHS, getting products into the NHS is probably one of the hardest things on the planet. I know. So, Why are you so excited when they approached me? <laughs> if you can do that as a teenager, I think you've done better than most people well into their 50s. So good on you on that one. Um, I, th I think there's definitely, you know, um, some very interesting approaches that one can take on partnering. Um, I don't, I, I think it's going to fall on the large organizations to change their way of working. Um, there are some amazing companies and there's some amazing initiatives. I think the B Corp status um, mm -hmm. that's come out, which is uh, companies, you know, self saying we're going to follow specific ethical guidelines. Um, and I know that the EU is taking steps to regulate uh, Facebook, Google, Amazon, and so on. Um, I think regulation has lagged. Uh, in terms of what is happening with the use of data. Um, but it will also, I believe, fall on the governments and, and probably people like Hadia that are in Pakistan that are, that are going to have to be quite vocal about this is our IP and you do not get to exploit it without our permission and on our terms. Because I know factually that um, the, a lot of European countries have already started doing that. And, and back to what Hadia said earlier, you know, even the smallest amount of money and people will give up a lot of things and so i'm not sure what the solution is but i sincerely hope that someone is working on a problem a solution sorry on the problem yeah do you have anything to say on this or well i mean i i think Rabia's earlier point about how monetized data has become, and we're hearing so much about big data, we're hearing so much about using all types of data. So we're now using administrative data, we're using anything that we can get our hands on, whatever we can scrub from any website, we want to use it to understand, um, not just understand behavior, but also use it to our advantage to market products, right? So. I think the approach that Elena has is fantastic. The, what Rabia has raised 
about self regulation to a certain extent but also government intervention and government regulation i think that stands i mean that that's a way that that's the way for for people to go for uh, economies to go i am an economist but i'm a development economist so i believe very strongly that government has a large role to play when it comes to improving welfare of individuals uh, in developing economies there is a lot of corruption there as far as the government is concerned so when you say that individuals are what is going to force uh, change in behavior i take that completely but we need to put pressure on big companies we need to put pressure on even governments when it comes to uh, extracting data from individuals i will say this though that as unethical as it is it, it still gives me hope when people pull in marginalized groups because at least their voices are being heard in some form or the other that is a major problem that we continue to face we don't let these voices be heard enough so in whatever form we can get these voices heard i'm happy for that and i definitely agree with that and it's a good point to segue into my last question So just a note we have about 5 minutes left. So as you answer the last question you can also give your your last words on the topic. And uh, as we're talking about the marginalized marginalized populations and circling back to our topic on gender data and harnessing the power of data to empower men. Um we've also talked about how in different areas of this data we still have to account for the um the racial biases like black women and white women are different demographics you have to you have to show that in your data sex workers and domestic workers you know and so how do we um ensure sorry um how do we ensure that women's experiences especially in precarious sectors such as domestic work and in the most marginalized populations um is reflected in collected data and i'm sure some of our answers may overlap but just as a recap to the session yeah. <laughs> um so i think in this and this is i think one of the first things that elena talked about it's uh, when it, whoever we want to be reflected in the data we have to go and talk to them we have to involve them and we have to involve them not just in the data collection but we have to involve them in the problem solving so your vision has to include problem solving and you have to be you have to approach the problem with a lot of empathy and when it comes to reflection of precarious work domestic work um when it comes to the reflection of sex work these are sectors which are, are taboo you know sectors which where it's difficult to approach people this these are sectors where it's you have to be very cognizant of the fact that when you go in and talk to these individuals you're causing them to lose out on their income for that time that you are sitting with them and talking to them you, so keeping the, the these individuals constraints in mind you have to design whatever data gathering exercise that you're doing such that you have the least impact on these individuals lives which are difficult as is and any solution that you come up with it can't be an external solution that you are imposing on these individuals so what we're seeing more and more when it comes to digital applications is that anything that we take from a western context and try and impose it in a context like pakistan which is very patriarchal the solution does add to the problem it doesn't get to the heart of the uh, heart of the issue either so unless you involve the communities in the design of the solution itself you're really not going to get anywhere should i go next and then we can leave Absolutely. last words to elena great um so i i loved what hadia just said which is like you can't copy paste from the western <laughs> world and into uh, a country like pakistan um and i i really echo that sentiment when we think about biology um you know the genetics are different and so how do we um think about making sure that every single segment of society but globally every single um diversity every all the diversity is captured within biology specifically addressing uh sex workers or women that are marginalized i don't know how to deal with that in the world that i live in other than like they are going to have very specific issues um and in 
developing countries like Pakistan and so on, we don't address them because it's so taboo. Um, and that's a, a very difficult problem to solve that I unfortunately probably can't make any intelligent comments on. But what I can say generally, um, you know, on capturing data, I think there are only two things I will say. One is that uh, really have to start thinking about um, personal data on a national level and how that's thought about because it is going to matter globally and um, making sure that the people whose data it is similar to what Hadia said have a voice and a say from day one it's not a solution that gets imparted onto them by some external entity um, and that's probably important and we need to start thinking about that as a community and that's probably beyond uh, gender um, I agree with um, everything that has been said. I think it's very important to empower um, uh, the communities themselves, uh, capacity building. It's um, really, really um, difficult sometimes to achieve, particularly in the kind of circumstances we live right now. Uh, but uh, it is pointless uh, for somebody like me in the UK uh, designing a solution for um, you know women based in Pakistan or Bangladesh or somewhere like that. Um, we do work um, with um, with different uh, foreign countries, but whenever I design a product, whether it's um, training teachers how to teach AI to kids, or whether it's um, you know some other form of consultancy related to education and STEM, um, I want to involve the people on the ground into developing the kind of program that will be suitable to them, suitable for them. Um, and so, for instance, right now we're working in Brunei um, and I said to them, you know, I'm happy to design a training program, you know, for teachers and I'm happy to to help you revamp uh, STEM education in Brunei. I was very um, excited when this uh, proposal came, uh, came to me, but I said I will only do it if I work directly with the teachers. So I'm not going to be teaching you the ways that I have taught some teachers in England how to teach AI and AI ethics. Um, uh, culturally, you're very different. I want to be working with the people on the ground to design the kind of solution that would be suitable and that, you know, um, is also has got some elements of your cultural peculiarities that I may not be aware of. And so that also happened whenever I worked in other parts of the world, like Africa or Asia. I've lived uh, for a while in, in Ethiopia and in Bangladesh. And whenever I was tasked in designing a product, and back in 20, 2005, 2008, there was no even technology you know, in, in that process, um, I would always involve the people who I am designing this service uh, or product for. And I think that is still very, very important. And that's what Heidi also um, mentioned. It's, it's very much in, at the very heart of human centered design thinking as well, um, that we really do design uh, for the people with the people we're designing for. It's, it's, it's quite simple, really, but it's not. Many companies do get it wrong. Um, and very many companies based in, in the West assume that once they go to other parts of the world in Asia, Africa, that um, you know what what they've designed would work, and very often times it it really doesn't. Um, and so um, I think, particularly when it comes to vulnerable communities or designing products that would help them, it's important to have them in the room um, as part of a focus group. Um, it's what we teach um, teenagers. It's something that companies often get it wrong. But if we start teaching this process at the very early ages when they're very young and when they understand this process is somehow so easily as you will see this evening during the demo day um, then I think there is definitely hope in the future um, in the meantime I know we still are having these issues um, and hopefully things will will get better but I, don't know. I hope that's enough <laughs> yeah and that's it is, um, <laughs> Right. Um, you have given us, you've given me so much to think about. Thank you so much for um, imparting your wisdom on this topic. And I guess my biggest takeaway from this is making sure that the people um, being researched about are involved both in the data collection and the problem solving and also keeping the constraints of our research um, respondents in mind when we're collecting data from them. I think that was the most important bit for me and 
I have a lot to think about. So thank you so much to our panelists for um, giving us their time and also to our attendees for joining us in this discussion. And I wish you all a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you, Garnet. Beautiful moderation as well. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Thank you. Bye. Have a good evening. <laughs>